You are listening to Radio Free Humanity, the Marxist Humanist Podcast. My name is Brendan Cooney. And I'm Andrew Kleiman. Today's episode features a really fascinating conversation. We welcome back David Columbia, this time to talk about the linguistic theories of Noam Chomsky uh, and explore the possible connection between Chomsky's linguistics and his politics. To hear more episodes of Radio Free Humanity, to read more about the issues discussed, or to join in the conversation, please visit MarxistHumanistInitiative.org. You can also make a donation to the podcast there on the website. While our podcast is hosted by MHI, the views expressed by the co-hosts and guests of Radio Free Humanity are their own. They do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of MHI. In just a moment, we'll be talking about Chomsky's linguistics with David Columbia. But first, as we do in every episode, we're going to take just a minute to talk about some current events. Today is July 6th, and we're going to be talking about a couple different pieces that came out recently in the wake of the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade. Uh, the first piece is by Chris Hedges in Salon. It came out on the 28th of June, and it's called Christian Fascism is Right Here, Right Now, After Roe, Can We Finally See It? And the second piece is from just the other day. Uh, it's by Catherine Stewart in the New York Times. She wrote on July 5th a piece called Christian Nationalists Are Excited About What Comes Next. Both pieces are discussing this rise of Christian fascism and its um, threat to U.S. democracy. Andrew, in the Chris Hedges piece, what do you think are like the, the main takeaways? You know, he has the belief, as does uh, Catherine Stewart, that the Christian nationalist far right has designs to get rid of democracy in America. So it's not limited to anti-abortion, getting rid of Roe, thereafter everything having to do with reproductive rights, contraception, same-sex marriage, etc. But not only even that, it's a, it's a program against democracy and for Christian dominion over every aspect of our lives. They, they both have that view, and I can't see that they're wrong. So the first thing that Hedges does is he details, counted it, 14 different Supreme Court decisions. I mean, some of them go way back, Citizens United, gutting the 65 Voting Rights Act. A lot of them, however, are much more recent. And when you think of the Christian fascists as having designs to get rid of democracy, lots and lots of different things fall under the rubric of Supreme Court decisions that further their agenda. I mean, what Chris Hedges does is also talk about his own bona fides. He's been covering this for a long time. He's the son of a minister and a seminary graduate. And he spends a lot of time blaming the intellectuals, the, the people who should have known better, and he says they did know better, for basically whitewashing and ignoring the Christian, you know, fundamentalist ideology and the danger that it represents. Uh, he says it was not ignorance, it was cowardice, and he goes into a number of incidents, you know, personal experience and so forth, to talk about that. I thought the most important thing uh, that he brought up was where he said at uh, Princeton University in a panel about uh, they were inaugurating the LGBT Center, this was 2006, he says, there is no dialogue with those who deny your legitimate right to be. At that point, it is a fight for survival. Uh, you know, we've been saying similar things, and I, I just think that's quite right. And the person who organized the event shut him off and said, this is a university, your talk is over, you can't say those kinds of things here. So he said, look, I, he had made his point, and then he uh, quotes a similar point made by Karl Popper, the philosopher, who said, tolerance is great, but if you have tolerance regarding intolerance, the people who are intolerant are going to like, crush your tolerance in you and everything. So you, you got to be realistic here. And I, th I think, you know, I got a lot of problems with Popper, but I, I think that that is right. I'm generally not a big fan of Chris Hedges because he kind of promotes this kind of anti-neoliberal left conspiracy view and the view that it's all really about, you know, the corporations raking in big bucks and impoverishing the population. But here I said, the guy has done a really good job. This is something he knows what he's talking about. And the Catherine Stewart piece hits a lot of the similar points. She has been following Christian nationalism for a while now. And she says that rather than this just being a moment for 
Christian fascism or nationalism, as she calls it, to celebrate and rest on its laurels. It says, on, she says, quote, on the contrary, movement leaders are already preparing for a new and more brutal phase of their assault on individual rights and democratic self-governance. Breaking American democracy isn't an unintended side effect of Christian nationalism. It is the point of the project. Both of these pieces reminded me of conversations that we've had over the years about um, the nature of fascist politics in America. There have been too many people who've been dismissive of the fascism label because they want some like one-to-one congruence between like American politics and European fascism from like 90 years ago in order to like qualify something as being fascist. But I'm reminded of a book that I think we've discussed before, Beyond the Mask of Chivalry by Nancy McLean, which is about the rise of the second iteration of the KKK where she argues that if fascism were, were ever to totally take hold of American politics, it would have to have a distinctly homegrown American character, and that would have to incorporate or maybe even be deeply rooted in American Christianity, at least the more like right-wing American Christianity. Because, look, these were some of the most reactionary ideas in our society exist and where they've been like incubating for decades and decades. Everything from like the hatred of women, the subordination of women, to homophobia, to racism, to deep authoritarianism, political violence, terrorist political violence against opponents, and the way like that authoritarianism is is mixed with this like extreme like motivation through repression and guilt and shame and the hatred of science, the creation of these narratives that pit the science and the media and the government against the people, the so-called people, these are like all such fascist tropes and they're like already all there present in that right-wing Christian tradition. Are you saying this is all the religion or or the the, the kind of fundamentalist uh, Christian nationalist sections of the religion? Yeah, just this Christian fascist aspects of, uh, I mean, there. I'm sure you can find some of this in a, a lot of American religions, but there's a lot of commonality between, you know, aspects of Catholicism, of Southern Baptism, Pentecostalism, even general like evangelicism. They all share the same type of very reactionary ad- ideas, and they control their members to the same mix of, like, fear, shame, repression. Right, but, but you're not saying it's it's all of the religions. I mean, they're they're kind of like liberal mainstream Protestant religions, right? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. The the other thing that's extremely interesting is there's a convergence wherein like the, the far right Catholics are becoming more like the far right evangelical Protestants and vice versa. Like the anti-abortion stuff was originally like a Catholic thing. The Protestants. Did, had nothing to do with it and even among like the jews the far right reactionary kind of fundamentalist ultra-orthodox sects they're becoming not to the same extent but they're becoming a lot more uh, similar in their political outlook and e- even their so-called religious outlook you know i'll tell you this is something that uh, raya Donevskaya was concerned about way way back uh, from the early or mid 1980s onward she said there the problem that we face now you know she says that we're in an age of retrogression and she said part of that was religious fundamentalism and i you know i first didn't understand what she was talking about like what is fundamentalism she didn't mean like extreme religiosity she meant this combination of kind of like a far right fascist agenda and being clothed in religious trappings and permeated with religion and she saw this as a worldwide phenomenon of course because you know 1979 the ayatollah khomeini and his people took control of iran and there was religious fundamentalism the ascendancy in israel and and so forth and so on so you know i I always think it's important to, to think of religion as one thing and it's got problems but religious fundamentalism is kind of like a different thing. Although, of course, it you know, wraps itself in religion as well. And there's something really like sick and disturbing going on when at the same time that these far-right Christian fascists are screaming about saving babies and fighting against so-called groomers to like save children, that the major scandals of our day that involve child sex abuse are the 
institutionalized child rape of the Catholic Church, or even more recently, the Southern Baptist Convention's report about sex abuse in their churches and the covering up of that. There's something like really crazy going on that these are religions that manipulate and control their populations through making people repress their own sexual desires and feel guilt about them and to then project that guilt on other people. And at the same time, the, some of the biggest atrocities, like real atrocities of perpetrated on children are happening by those institutions, not just by like outliers, but are like, it's like part of the institutional fabric of the Catholic Church that these things happen. Uh, look, a- a- every, everything about the Christian nationalists and the, the non-Christian, you know, nationalists of the same ilk, everything about them is disturbing. Both of the pieces, Catherine Stewart's piece, Chris Hedges' piece, just came out and said, look, these people view you as the enemy, and they are out to control you or to kill you. And Catherine Stewart, quote, they had a, a big conference last month in Nashville. Trump was a keynote speaker. And what did he say? The greatest danger to America is the destruction of our nation from the people from within. And you know the people I'm talking about. These people are, are very dangerous. And yes, it's coming from the top. It's well organized. It's well bankrolled by some corporations. But there is a, a, a base that eats this stuff up. It's hard to get rid of this. I mean, when you've got a so-called religion that tells you that you're chosen and your way is right and everything should be your way and nothing should be anybody else's way, it's obviously attractive to a lot of people, especially people who just don't find secular society and modernism and science uh, all that congenial to begin with. Hedges and Stewart pulled their punches a little bit in the sense that they don't blame the base as much as they blame the leadership of the Christian right. Yeah, I was kind of getting at that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. They have this outlook that these are kind of people that are manipulated to some extent. And, you know, we've obviously advanced like an analysis of the Trump Trumpist base for a while that doesn't pull any punches and is comfortable with saying like these are people who have reactionary beliefs on their own. The base is driving the, the political leaders to take more radical positions. There is something, though, that I don't quite understand the whole psychology of, right? But because, like, repression of desire is such a part of Christian nationalism, I mean, these people are, like, adopting beliefs that are, like, self-hating to some extent, right? You're always, like, repressed homosexuals, women who believe that, you know, women's place is to obey men, women who go and get abortions, but they're still like protest outside the same abortion clinics they got their abortion at. These people who are like engaged in this like self-hating ideology and that like drives their behavior in some ways. That is like, I'm still trying to figure out like what what to make of that. Right. Well, you know, I, I don't know it from the inside. You know, I've read only a little bit about it, but it's not that these people are like striving for saintliness and for asceticism or something like this. What, what I've read is that, you know, among the base, they're actually very indulgent and lenient about their own behavior and, and that of the people around them. There's always an out in these religions, like in some versions of Protestantism, all you really need to do is accept Jesus Christ in your heart. And in in Catholicism, you just confess your sins and you do some penance and you move on. So there's a certain out given within the, the religion to actually extremely vile behavior because you can do something about it. And then you're okay. And it's the people who don't do anything about it who are the ones to be to be crushed. I mean, that's just a feature of, of these uh, religions, it's, you know, these kind of get out of jail free cards. But sociologically, I, I think is the real question is, is what is it that inculcates this kind of ideology? I mean, it's, it's probably this fascist, you know, us versus them stuff is, is what's going on. And, and the rest of it is just tailoring your religion to fit the needs of wanting to dominate everybody else. Yeah, maybe that's that's just what it is. About a decade ago or so, you know, there was this pushback on the so-called far left against the new, new atheists. Dawkins, Hitchens, and so forth. And a lot of it had to do with either real or alleged Islamophobia. 
uh, among them, but there are differences among these these guys. And I, I always thought one of the really important things that the new atheists emphasized is, no, the fact that you have faith is not something to be commended, you know, because that, that all kinds of like well-intentioned liberal thinking people said, oh, well, you know, these people have faith, and, and isn't that admirable? That people, No, it's not admirable that you have faith. If you have faith in something that you have no good evidence for, that is not something good, that's, that's something bad. But a, a lot of people who identified as Marxists were against the new atheists, not only for some real or imagined Islamophobia and so forth, but because of an understanding of what Marx had said uh, about religion that I think is misplaced here. You know, what Marx said, of course, one of the most famous things he said is, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses, is the soul of a soulless world. In other words, as long as the world totally sucks, you're going to have the creation of, in people's consciousness, imaginary worlds that are better than it. Okay, so it's the soul of a soulless world, and it gives people comfort. It's the uh, opiate of, of the masses. The problem is, that's all well and good for talking about a religious impulse, but it has nothing to do with the rise of Christian fascism and other kinds of religious fundamentalism. That is not what is driving, you know, religious fundamentalism, Christian fascism, and so forth. Here's the upshot. When you say, oh, well, religion's always going to reappear, it's the soul of soulless world until we have socialism. What that tells you is, let's struggle for socialism, get be behind us, get behind our program, build the left, you know, and only when we're victorious can we solve the problem. Until then, you know, w what the hell? And so, j just like these people have not struggled against Trumpism, they haven't struggled against uh, the, the, the rise of fundamentalism and taken it to task. I, I think that's a really bad thing to do, and to claim that it's rooted in Marx, I think, is completely wrong as well, because he was not talking about religion-inspired fascism. He was talking about something else entirely, and so to I ignore the political character of what takes religious trappings and to make that just a species of religion is just completely wrong. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Up next, our conversation with David Columbia about Noam Chomsky's linguistics. We are pleased to welcome back to the podcast today, David Columbia, this time to talk about the linguistic theories of Noam Chomsky. A lot of people know Noam Chomsky by his politics, but of course his day job is as a linguist at MIT. And that's not something we hear talked about a lot outside of the linguistic field. So this should be a really interesting conversation. We're going to talk about Chomsky's linguistic theories and explore whether there's any relationship between that and his politics. This topic came up in a somewhat roundabout way. David Columbia is a professor of English, and he's taught linguistics before and has written about Chomsky's linguistics. But we had him on the podcast to talk about one of his other areas of expertise, which is the right-wing ideology behind cryptocurrency. Uh, but David told us after that that he had been listening to the podcast and he really appreciated our episode 68 that we did on Noam Chomsky's very problematic position on Ukraine and Syria and his politics in general. And he said, hey, if you want to do a, uh, have a conversation about Chomsky's linguistics, we could do that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So David Columbia, welcome back to the podcast. Thrilled to be here. I, I don't get a chance to talk about Chomsky very often. It's uh, I should say at the outset, I mean, I, I find him an extremely fascinating and incredibly smart person with uh, remarkable influence over the um, intellectual life worldwide as well as in the U.S. I, I find a lot to be critical of in what he says and does, but um, I don't think he can be easily dismissed in a lot of ways. Um, more in the linguistics field, but I mean, we can talk more about that. But um, I mean, I do appreciate some of what he says politically, too. I, but as you said in that great episode with Bill Weinberg, like his dogmatism almost forces him to end up at places where you, you just think, how can, a, how can a person who has any kind of wishes well to the people around him possibly say stuff like this? I don't know that everybody is going to immediately understand or if they they might understand but not agree with David's characterization of Chomsky as dogmatic so I was wondering if he could uh, go into that 
Sure. I mean, I, I think that as you folks were talking about in that podcast, and as Bill Weinberg was um, in his own self-described rant, he has this kind of reflexive anti-Americanism in which the U.S. is the only bad actor in the world, or the at least uniquely bad in its in its power, and kind of anything that stands in the way of that power is therefore something to be celebrated, and in fact, maybe even just as disturbingly, you know, the idea that most actors in the world are not real, they're not real people, they're simply like puppets of the U.S., which is kind of how he talks about Ukraine. And I, I see that as dogmatism. And as, you know, people from Ukraine have responded to Chomsky and saying, we are real people. We want to fight back. We don't want to give into, the, into this invasion of our country. And don't tell us that we're just puppets of this foreign power that we actually aren't puppets of at all. Yeah, in your correspondence with us when we were trying to uh, arrange this episode, you you mentioned an interesting uh, parallel between what Chomsky's been saying about Ukraine and the so-called realist camp of international relations, foreign policy thinking, most recently Henry Kissinger, but uh, Mearsheimer has been saying the same thing. Can you explain what you were referring to? I mean, you got, I think to most people, to compare Henry Kissinger, the architect of uh, the U.S. involvement in the war of Vietnam, with Noam Chomsky, that would be, it's kind of like make your, your head explode. But what, what are you getting at with that? I, I didn't have much more beyond just the, the very strange occurrence. I don't know that it, I can even think of a moment when it's happened before where you actually had Chomsky and Kissinger come out and basically recommend the same policy. And other people have noticed this too, right? And Weinberg himself, I think his latest episode is about Kissinger and Chomsky saying the same thing. That is so strange. And I, if I can be speculative for a minute and try to tie this into the linguistic stuff that we can talk more about, I mean, Chomsky's politics... What he says his politics are is a very, very strong anti-authoritarianism, right? He claims to be an anarcho-syndicalist or some kind of libertarian socialist um, in which the worst thing is the illegitimate use of power that one should not have, right? Or I guess that goes without saying when it's illegitimate. But what's so interesting is that he seems to focus very, very intently on people who do have that kind of power, which he then often magnifies beyond its real role in the world, right? The U.S. is this hegemon that can just make other countries do whatever they want. NATO is simply a bunch of U.S. client states that the U.S. has forced into this membership, despite what appear to be objective historical appearances that they asked to join and applied and all this stuff. And what is so interesting about this is that in his professional linguistic life, the way Chomsky is understood institutionally is as an extremely dictatorial, authoritarian leader who does not deserve the amount of power that he's gotten. And that is part of what has made him so interesting to me, right? If you read, there are many really wonderful histories of Chomsky's linguistics as a um, social and historical phenomenon, right? And uh, the greatest is a book by a guy named Randy Allen Harris called The Linguistics Wars, which I, um, despite being about a very dry academic topic, I recommend to all kinds of people. It's just an incredibly exciting book. And what you see Chomsky doing is acting as a dictatorial leader who has decided that he has domain over the entire academic field of linguistics, and it should be up to him what counts as real work and what doesn't. And, you know, that is not how academic fields are supposed to work, right? I mean, yes, people become dominant, and of course, everybody throws their weight around, but Chomsky's takes this to an extreme that is really unusual. And he doesn't seem to be able to self-reflect on this. I mean, people have pointed this out to him for decades. Like, why do you operate this way? Why do you think it's okay, you know, to just try to destroy people and their careers when they in any way disagree with you or they have alternative paradigms to yours? Or, I mean, the number of careers that Chomsky has single-handedly ruined is astronomical. And the, many of those he didn't ruin, only did he not ruin them because his control over the field is limited. And so some people have gone on to have careers, you know, as ex-Chomskyans. The most famous is the linguist George Lakoff, who is at Berkeley, who um, has become a pretty well-known commentator on the rhetoric of politics, among many other topics. And But people don't know that he actually started out as a, as a Chomsky follower who took Chomsky's work and kind of twisted it in a direction that Chomsky didn't like, and then he was excommunicated. Um, how dare you take my work in a direction that I don't, don't want? 
And only because Lakoff is a very smart guy, he was able to sort of move beyond that. But the, the fact that Chomsky is like he sees the world in terms of dictators. Right? I think that is that is how he sees the world. And I think he's wrong. Right? I don't think that is. I mean, certainly authoritarians and dictators have a lot of power and are a huge problem. But a lot of people are not dictators, right? And a lot of people do have, and and frankly, academic fields are better when they don't have dictators running them. And there is something going on in the fact that he, you can't say this to him, right? I mean, it's, I'm not saying anything that hasn't been said to him a dozen times, but he can't, if, if it's said to him, he'll just use words like nonsense, right? I had, and, 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 and Brendan saw it, I had some correspondence with him when we, we invited him to, to respond, uh, you know, after we had done the podcast. And he, he, was, he was extremely abusive. The, the phrase that came to my mind uh, when you were talking about him and being very dictatorial is, you probably read it, it's a New Yorker piece on him from about 20 years ago by uh, Larissa McFarquhar, and she said, Chomsky is an extraordinarily violent person. I, I reread that recently, and it stuck with me. One thing I, I really uh, thought was extremely interesting about that piece is she talks about how he has uh, conducted himself within the linguistics uh, discipline. She also like intersperses that with how he deals with challenges, like he's at M- MIT and he's talking about, you know, this is just some students' seminar or whatever. He's talking about U.S. foreign policy, and this is uh, this was written around the time. Of of the uh, you know the U.S. war in I guess it's Iraq and somebody was like trying to challenge him and he just like kept talking over this kid wouldn't let the kid get a word in edgewise people in the audience are screaming let the kid talk let the kid talk he's ignoring that you know and and eventually eventually the kid like just gets tired and sits down you know and Chomsky wins and you know so there's a, the, the, that account and the, the account of a linguist the woman who came to talk to him in his office and he just like pummeling her, not with his fists, but, you know, with words. So there's a pattern, and it bridges the linguistics and, 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 the, and the politics. What she says about him, or she quotes somebody saying about him and why he, he's like this, is, well, he takes linguistics very seriously. You know, for him, it's not a game. And obviously, politics for him is not a game either. So he, he treats it with deadly seriousness. I don't know what you think about that. I mean, it's deadly serious to most of the people who work on it, but many people manage to work on important academic fields without being violent in that way. And, and there is something in excess in the way he conducts himself that, um, you know, I know I have no and have been privileged to meet quite a few really important academics in my life. And some of them can be quite tyrannical, right? But I think uh, no one is, a, a, even there, a special case. Um, and, and none of it is necessary, right? I mean, I think, in contrary to some of his critics, I don't think his linguistics is entirely invalid or entirely useless, even though I think it's mostly turned out to be wrong. But he didn't need to do any of that stuff to get these ideas heard, right? I mean, the, the ideas were powerful in and of themselves, and none of this seemed necessary. You know, it's a very interesting thing, right, in that um, we use words like decontextualized and, and things. And Chomsky, he insists that his politics and his linguistics have nothing to do with each other, right? They are, are entirely separate. And Nobody, including Chomsky himself, in the current, if there is anything in the last 50 years of intellectual practice or 100 years, you know, the idea that different activities that a single person engages in, in a really, you know, in a long term, invested, passionate way are entirely separate is something that most people would just reject out of hand. Of course, they're not separate. You know, this is one person. They must have some deep drives that it, that inform these things. And Chomsky, you know, it makes him angry when you suggest that these two things might be connected in him. That kind of, you know, don't you dare make me look at these two opposing parts of myself and reacting with anger, that is a mark of a psychological problem, right? That, I mean, that's, that's sometimes referred to as splitting, like, you know, that you can see the world in two very different ways and don't you dare even ask me to, to show that they're the same. And of course, Chomsky always accuses his enemies of having a single unified agenda that is informed by whatever their their obedience to a certain state or political figure or something. So I don't even think he really believes it. But he, I honestly believe he cannot let himself look at his own internal motivations. He has to believe that you know that he is able to compartmentalize in a way that other people are not. Maybe to get into the linguistics a little bit, that I think is so interesting is 
a lot of the reason that people get interested in linguistics, in my experience, in language, in my experience, is because they understand language to be a fundamentally human phenomenon. Right? And they, it, you know, maybe to even be the thing that is definitive of being human, Chomsky would agree with that. But that often means that it's because they have connections to other people or communities that they have been part of or pe- you know, people they've interacted with. And they want to explore language in part as a means of understanding human connection and communication. And that's one of the reasons that linguistics has been one of the fields that to the degree the academy has sort of reached out of its like colonial infrastructure, linguistics has been one of the fields that's been kind of at the edges of it. Because, you know, one of the things that a lot of linguists have wanted to know going all the way back to Humboldt is, oh, what are all the languages spoken in the world? And how do they differ from and how are they similar to each other? And in order to know that, we have to go and talk to people who speak all these languages, which it turns out there are thousands of. So you get linguists going out and talking, you know, white linguists going out and talking to Native Americans and people who live on remote islands in the Pacific. And a lot of those people, those are like, let's say, good human beings who they go and talk to these people who aren't like them and they learn that they have things in common and they want to treat them with respect and they want to learn about their cultures and so forth. You know, when we ask about what is the Chomskyan revolution in linguistics, there is the theoretical apparatus we can talk about, but there's also a kind of practical apparatus. And the practical thing is that until Chomsky came along to be a linguist in the U.S., you had to go and learn another language, right? And you were there was some pressure exerted to go and learn a language um, in the Bloomfieldian tradition, for example, to go and learn a language from a Native American or another like indigenous speaker worldwide and to write down what you saw. And, you know, this was called collecting data and there were all kinds of problems with the Native informants that the relationships between the ac- academics and the Native informants. But, you know, when you go back and read what these people said, they were often some of the most critical, thoughtful, socially engaged scholars that the academy has produced, right? And they were often anthropological in orientation, and they did do some of the early work of saying the academy does not treat these people right. We need to take them more seriously. And in fact, this native informant I worked with was a participant in my research. They weren't like the object that I took information from. They We worked together to create this research and so on. And when Chomsky came along, that's one of the things he put an end to. All of a sudden, linguists did not go out into the field and work with other with people who spoke languages they didn't know, which is absolutely remarkable. Now he didn't he didn't stop it entirely, right? In fact, in most universities where the linguistics program is not Chomsky, and you do still have to do that kind of field work, and I think that is tremendous, right? I think that is a great part of the discipline. And one of the interesting like bifurcations in linguistics is that it's the people who go out and do field work for the most part who aren't Chomskyans. And the Chomskyans, for the most part, don't do field work. They think you can figure out everything about language by introspecting to your own intuitions. Um, it's not even clear. Chomsky himself, his facility with languages other than English appears to be very limited, which is, you know, obviously you can be a linguist and only know one language, but in general, that is not the norm. Well, he knows Hebrew. He seems to know Hebrew. Um, he certainly well, he, knows. Oh, he, he, he knows Hebrew, no, <laughs> doesn't he? I mean, come on. Well, he certainly knew Hebrew in the 1950s. Um, okay. And he probably does. Let's put it this way. After the work in phonology in the 1950s in Hebrew, he never went back and referred to Hebrew in his written, in his written work, which is unusual. Most linguists refer to all kinds of languages and what they write. Chomsky, when he does, it's almost always somebody else's example that they've used in their research. And he certainly didn't push people to go and learn other languages because his conception of what language is, is this internal thing that is happening in our heads. It isn't this stuff that people speak which is very, very odd, right? It's just, it is such an odd thing. He basically walked into a field and said, look, your entire object of study is misguided. You aren't studying language. You're studying performance, which is of no interest to us. Um, In many ways, you know, you can't even get your head around that. Like, how how can that be the case? In fact, um, one of Chomsky's earliest disciples who became a big critic of his, um, Paul Postel, a very interesting guy who was a professor at at NYU, or at least was until recently, he wrote one of the first dissertations. I don't know that it was under Chomsky, but Chomsky was one of the advisors, and he was um, very closely allied to it. It was on Mohawk. Uh, 
right? And it was uh, because Mohawk is spoken in New York State and Postal had some access to at least written documents, but I think to actual people who spoke Mohawk. And you might think that if Chomsky's point is he's discovered a universal language facility that applies to everyone, regardless of what language they speak, he would be very interested in data from non-English languages. He would want data from every language imaginable. And in fact, to the contrary, that work was ridiculed and put aside and thought to be irrelevant. And that's part of what really kind of radicalized Postal against Chomsky, because he was like, I thought this was what you wanted, right? Because, you know, he did, to some extent, show that he thought Mohawk f followed some of Chomsky's rules. It just at that moment did not fit Chomsky's own ideas about what linguistics was. I don't think Chomsky had any idea about this sort of this, let's say, broader political project that linguists up to Bloomfield had been involved in, in which connecting with especially speakers of small minority languages was a big part of what they were up to. And, and they thought that this had a real political purpose. And I don't think Chomsky saw that one bit. And I don't think he even understood what he had done at some level, even though he certainly had disdain for their object of study and said that quite openly. Right. I'm interested in both, you have mentioned Lakoff and Postal. They were two of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, correct? The participants in the linguistic wars, evidently Chomsky took a sabbatical from MIT and some of the younger people revolted and he came back and he managed uh, with some difficulty to quash it after a while, if I'm understanding correctly what took place. But the issue, there were a lot of issues, but the main issue seemed to be that Chomsky and the Chomsky and approach to linguistics looked at language outside of language being communication in a social environment. It looked at language as, as you said, that of an individual. In an essay on open democracy, you say Chomsky took a discipline that had been profoundly committed to the social and political contexts and consequences of its subject human language, and flipped it on its head so that nearly everything relating to those aspects of language could be jettisoned and only the individual was of much interest. I think I see a parallel between what Chomsky does with linguistics and what he does with politics that I'd like us to get to, but can you, like, for lay people who don't really know what's going on, can you give, like, an example of the kind of things that of the kind of way that, that Chomsky would approach language and that his critics in the linguistic wars were saying, no, you're ignoring the context and then failing to understand the language because you're ignoring the context. So I think the linguistics wars and the context things are a little, little bit separate, but let me just talk about the context thing a little bit. So one thing to say is there is nothing in human experience that is of, has been of more interest across every culture, every world, intellectual tradition, and all kinds of thinking than language, right? Everybody is interested in language, and rightly so. You know, there are at least two ways of looking at language that have been influential, and you'll find variants of them across the whole world. One of them looks at language as this is the means, the medium in which we communicate with each other. And so what we want to do is look at how language facilitates people talking. And the second one is language is what we think with. And so what we want to talk about when we talk about language is our own intellectual capacity. A word that became really prominent in, as Chomsky rose to power was cognition, right? That actually what language does is it enables cognition or thinking, and that's its primary function. And to be totally fair, these are both parts of language. They are both mysterious and fascinating. I don't think any dispassionate observer, including Chomsky, if you ask him the question the right way, would ever deny that both of these are enormous parts of the human language capacity. But to Chomsky, the communication stuff is secondary. It's just not that interesting. And he actually doesn't even think it's important if we understand language. Language is just what's going on in the mind. He almost has this, you know, at certain moments, he sounds like he's saying, a person would have language even if they were raised completely by themselves and, you know, never encountered another person, they would still have language, which is a very counterintuitive idea that most people don't really credit, right? And yet Chomsky almost thinks, like, actually, they'd have all of language because language is innate and, you know, you can't think without it. So if a person can think, they have language and stuff becomes really, it starts to turn in on itself. 
because sometimes Chomsky seems to talk as if when he's talking about language, he just means the capacity to think. He doesn't actually mean the words and sentences that come out of our mouths, even though, of course, that's what he's talking about most of the time. But in any case, those anthropological linguists who I was talking about, all the way up to Bloomfield, but also earlier people, Boaz and Sapir and these wonderful linguists of the early 20th century, they were primarily focused on communication. Right? They were prim primarily focused on how people use language in order to communicate, how, how language facilitates communication and how it in interferes with communication, as it often does. And Chomsky was just like, no, language is, and this is part of why I got so interested in him, metaphorically at least, the brain is a computer and language is a program that, that the brain runs automatically. And what we're interested in doing is trying to figure out, we're trying to decode, trying to print out that program and see what it says. And this is a very strange idea, right? And it may even have some, it may be true to some limited extent, but it isn't really what anybody would think of in terms of like what they understand what language is. And maybe here's, I can give an example. Let's, let's presume we have, a, we have an ordinary communication situation with two people in it. And one person says to the other, or here is a stick, as they give them a stick. Now, the communication-centered person might look at that and say, okay, well, there's two individuals involved, and there's an action, and there's an item that's being transferred between the two of them. So whatever they communicate is going to probably have some way of designating the two people and the stick and the action. And that's all you need to say, right? That is sometimes called the functionalist, broadly speaking, that is the functionalist view of language. Language emerges from the pressures of the kind of communicative context in which it exists. I don't need to say a lot more about how it is that those two people came up with the idea of there being a word for me and a word for you and a word for stick and a word for give. You know, it's just kind of built into the situation. Chomsky wants to say that there is some kind of engine inside the brain that predetermines that I'm going to have these slots for I, you, give, and stick, and that exists in some kind of abstract computer program-like mechanism, and that just so happened to serve the communicative need that emerges later. And in fact, what language is, is that program. It isn't that, that speech act that happens between the two people. And, you know, that is a strange idea, because... You can, as I just did, tell the whole story with any kind of internal architecture to describe it, right? You just like, okay, there are these entities that are salient to the people involved, and they come up with words for them. And the words, you know, are flexible and you know, all kinds of things. At some level, he wants to believe that this program that generates these, you know, these slots or whatever it does in the brain is the real thing that linguists should be interested in not in the words that are used by the two people who are speaking to each other, which might, well, arguably is a fascinating thing to study, but is part of what is so interesting about, like, Chomsky's, like, violence, right? Like, why do we have to call that language? Why should we stop people from studying those utterances that are exchanged between the two people and instead make them focus on this computer program that you claim is happening inside the brain? And, you know, by the way, that computer program gave rise to an entirely separate field of academic work called cognitive science that basically came out of Chomsky's own work uh, that, at least in its early days, was sort of committed to the view that what we want to do is figure out how people's capacity to know and think emerges, and that is also machine-like. Um, we could ultimately emulate it in a machine. Cognitive science itself has broken away from that paradigm, and as we can talk about, Chomsky's own work has actually broken away from this paradigm in large part. You know, when I talk about some of why Chomsky was so attractive, I think that that model of kind of replacing communication and inter and the fuzziness of communication and the sort of context embedded way that all communication happens with this view that there is some kind of imperial machine like capacity in the brain. And that is something we need to study. Like that is something that one can imagine being very appealing to a certain way of looking at the world that I personally identify with what I see as um, mostly falling on the political right rather than the political left, you know, all the way down to the idea that human beings are machines, which I see as being a pretty clearly far right view. Yeah. So in, 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 I think we forgot to mention the paper at the top of the interview, but 
um, the paper that I think Andrew referenced earlier is called The Chomsky and Revolution and the Politics of Linguistics, and it's at Open Democracy. And I think it's part of a series of papers that different people were writing about. It was, it was basically based around Chris Knight's book, Decoding Chomsky. Is that right? Yep. Okay. But one of the things you talk about is you ask this question in your paper, like why did Chomsky's approach catch on? Like what was the, why did it attract adherence and funding, right? Um, so you talk about this sort of general political pressure or uh, that there was something potentially appealing about a linguistics that had this very atomistic, like rationalist worldview, right? Because this was at a time when, I mean, maybe I'm paraphrasing you too strongly, but there were political pressures to purge the academy of left leftist thinking. Is that basically what you were you're arguing in the paper? Uh, let me just add a slight amount of nuance to that in the sense that, so we're talking about the 1950s. I mean, that's when Chomsky became famous. And it is pretty clear that in there, there was a lot of pressure from, you know, the McCarthyite elements in government and the cold warriors who were all over the place. There was a view that looking too much at society and at people as communicative beings and so forth was itself inherently socialistic. And that therefore you should try to purge purge is too strong, but you should really try, try to encourage work in these fields that looked at human beings as rational individuals and discourage work that looked at us in our in social embeddedness with with each other. And if one were to be, I mean, I think this purge was, in, again, purge is too strong, but I think this movement was inexcusable and very destructive. But there's an element of truth to it in the sense that, yes, a lot of the people who did this work were, in fact, sympathetic with socialism or sympathetic with the welfare state or Marxists or, you know, they did tend to be people of the left. They were not necessarily, in fact, most of them were not in any way pawns of the Soviet Communist Party or whatever, but they certainly did lean left. They probably supported people like Eugene Debs. I don't think they were, they were not anti-American in any important, you know, in the way that the McCarthyites thought, but they weren't wrong that that kind of general orientation is something that I think, you know, leads, it fits a lot more naturally with the more left view of the world that, you know, in which we take other people and their needs seriously, and we don't just look at ourselves as imperious dictatorial rulers of, of our environment, but we are concerned with our other people being served, our other people happy, our other people getting what they need. You know, um, I do think there's a certain natural falling of these ideas um, as was so, you know, Chomsky obviously has never been anything but a person of the left. And yet, I think within the academy, his ideas fit really snugly into what the political right wanted to see happen. Yeah, I think you made a very strong case for that in your article, the, the one on open democracy. You're basically saying, why did Chomsky's stuff become so popular? And it was because there was a demand for it, you know? I mean, it was supplying, whether he knew it or not, whether that was the purpose or not, there were just people clamoring in mainstream thought for, you know, this basic idea that uh, human beings' minds are uh, machines. And part of where I got that idea was because I have spent quite a time, a bit of time, like, you know, going to linguistic conferences and talking to linguists. And I, my last appointment, I was on a linguistics faculty even. And one of the things that is so odd is that, you know, it is the anti-Chomskyans who are, who seem to naturally be of the left. And the Chomskyans in the department tend to be seen as conservatives. And, and Chomsky and departments tend to be seen as conservative. They are mostly staffed with white men. They are mostly white men who don't want to talk about affirmative action or, you know, economic inequality or all the things that people on the left might want to talk about. And this was really curious to me. I'm like, because I, I first learned of Chomsky, like most of us do, as a spokesperson for the left. And I was like, what is going on here? Why are these people who seem like they are very comfortable with conservative ideas being the supporters of this guy? And then the people, I should say, mostly the women, mostly the people of color in linguistics departments tend not to be Chomskyans. And that was a very odd thing to, to, to see in practice, that it was not falling out politically as one might expect. And I guess that formed a sort of puzzle for me that I had to try to untangle. I like to come back to this uh, issue of decontextualization and, and link it to what I see as how that appears in Chomsky's politics. 
But the reason I, I, I got that idea that the linguistic wars were about that, correct me, but I'm, I, I'm not an expert in this field, but, but actually I'm, I'm, I'm looking here at that uh, article by Larissa McFarquhar in The New Yorker, and here's what she says. Uh, the generative semanticists, that was... Postal and, and, and Lakoff at that time felt that Chomsky's dismissal of communication was crazy. They were influenced by ordinary language philosophy. They argued that sentences cannot be understood outside of a specific conversational context. A sentence like, quote, Spiro conjectures exlax. Spiro conjectures exlax, for instance. Uh, that was one of their typical examples, seems like ungrammatical nonsense, except when understood as a response to the question, does anyone know what Pat Nixon frosts her cakes with? Spiro conjectures ex uh, uh, Chomsky carefully erected methodological walls to keep his grammar pure, free from the messiness of the social, but the generative semanticists gleefully punched holes in the walls to let all the beautiful chaos flood back in. So that's where I'm getting the the idea that the, the context was the issue of context was relevant to to, to those linguistic wars. Oh, you're completely right. I, I should have refreshed myself better. That is that does ring very true with what I remember of the linguistics wars and the generative semanticists. Okay, I'm glad we're all on the same page about this. So, how does this inform Chomsky's politics? I don't know if you've had any communication with him, but. There's a, there's a typical thing that Chomsky does, a typical Chomsky move, and a t- typical move of his devotees, his followers, or whatever. You know, you say, oh, he denied Pol Pot's uh, genocide, you know, or whatever in, in Cambodia, and he'll point to where he says, it might be Pol Pot, you know, and you say, like, you know, he's uh, plumping for Putin, and he will point to you where he says, oh, you know, I say Putin's a monster. And he's always able to have some, to some people, some plausible deniability, and that's how he's able to maintain, I guess, that he's an anarchist. He's always able to maintain that he's not uh, an apologist, he's not a genocide denier, and he's not engaging in whataboutism. He's just telling us the facts that are not being we're not being privy to because of the the mass media, right? Pawns of pawns of the mass media. Now it seems to me that that kind of stuff works if you look at does Chomsky explicitly excuse genocide? Does Chomsky explicitly maintain that such and such an act in uh, Bosnia or whatever did not happen, right? And you don't have that. But what it seems to me that all of that kind of stuff ignores is Chomsky is speaking in a broader social political context. His words have meanings. His words have effects out there in the world. And just like he thinks that there's only the big powers and that you can't escape those two powers. So if like, hey, you know, you're the Ukrainian people and you're Zelensky, if you're if you're trying to fight for yourself, well, you're really just a pawn of, of, of the U.S. There's a lack of introspection. Like, what role do you play in this big power struggle, Noam? You know, so I think I think that that, that the fact that Chomsky operates in a political context and is not just speaking to us plain facts and is not just speaking to us innate morality of every human being and that his political speech and his political actions are interventions in the world. I, I think that, that he does, actually does not understand the, that context. What, what, would, what would you say about that? Uh, it's, it's very interesting. I, I am it is true that trying to understand where he sees himself in regard to the way he sees geopolitics is you can't figure it out, right? He see somehow escaped the thought control that keeps all the rest of us prisoner. He does say different things. I mean, he does this in his linguistics too, frankly, which is part of what makes some of what he says so impenetrable. And in fact, helped drive the generative semanticist thing because they were like picking up on stuff that he'd written and saying, oh, look, it naturally leads here. And he'd be like, no, 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 I didn't mean that when I said that. I meant something else, which is not unlike some of the stuff he does politically. I'm struggling a little bit to sort of line it up there, but I I, I agree with your intuition that uh, he sees himself as being outside of context, that he sees everybody else as absolutely being 
subject to, right? And and just like he sees his own language, which is you know that's part of what is so funny. Like I think Chomsky thinks that the subject of linguistics is actually Noam Chomsky's own internal thought processes. Uh, yeah. Certainly, that's where he gets most of his data from. <laughs> yes, touche. You know what this recalls to my mind is my favorite philosopher, third thesis on Feuerbach. The materialist doctrine that men are the products of circumstances and upbringing forgets that men change circumstances and the educator must himself be educated. Hence, this doctrine is bound to divide society into two parts, one of which is superior to society. To, to me, this is just it. It's like, you know, every, everybody is, is bound by context and they're, they're, they're implicated in, in this and that and their struggle between the, the big powers, except Chomsky and Chomsky and linguistics. There's just this kind of lack of self-awareness and, and lack of uh, reflexivity that's mind-boggling to me from, you know, he's a sophisticated, smart person. We have seen how, and I don't want to get too conspiratorial about this, but we have seen how, to many people, when you put yourself forward as a kind of dictatorial authority who asserts that they, you know, they uniquely have the answer to things and is ready to respond with some amount of violence to challenges to that, that is weirdly attractive to a lot of people, right? And despite the fact that it is often done by people who don't actually have the goods and Another interesting aspect of Chomsky's career is that um, as you know, Chomsky's career, Chomsky's theory has gone through several waves, usually referred to as having five distinct waves, which of course he will insist are all the same, but there are certainly radical differences between the fifth and latest wave and the first wave, and even the other early ones. And the last wave is called the minimalist program. And um, much as the title suggests, it minimizes the program, and that refers both to kind of the computer program that is supposed to live in the head, but also the Chomsky and research program, which has now been minimized to, in his opinion, its optimal and smallest feature, all of which is fine, right? Um, in fact, I think the minimalist theory is a lot more attractive than the earlier theories. But when you think about it socially, what's happened is he said, my theory is getting smaller and smaller, and there is nothing to do after it. It's reached its optimal or minimal form. And therefore, there can be no Chomsky after me, right? I, th this theory ends with me. I'm in charge of it. And like, I am this, you know, uber authority on linguistics that nobody will ever challenge. And I have seen him give lectures. You know, there are all these like acolytes, right, who have written books and things trying to lay out the latest version of the Chomsky theory, some, some of which he refers to quite um, approvingly and incorporates it into his own work. But he keeps cutting these people off, right? Even these people who are nothing but his supporters and friends. But it's clear that some of them desire to be Chomsky too after Chomsky passes away, and he will not have it. There cannot be another dictator like him. Uh, again, I'm using dictator loosely. To me, I think, you know, and I'm not alone in thinking this, that this this sort of authoritarian trend in his own psychology is a big part of what makes him so attractive. And he obviously cannot consider that, right? He can't look at his own place in the social world as having played some role, right? It just has to be the raw genius of his linguistic theory, not the way he has manipulated and pushed around and often bullied and harmed people. And in fact, that this kind of bullying and harm, coupled with other factors, can be the things that have made him so powerful. But I think that, in fact, they are the things that have made him so powerful, and in part, that make him seem so special, and not just yet another smart linguist, which is with an interesting theory that, you know, we could consider the way we do many other people's theories. Hey, we're going to return to this conversation in just a moment, but first, as we do in every episode, we're going to take just a few minutes to hear from Angie Clard, Organizational Secretary of Marxist Humanist Initiative, the organization which sponsors this podcast. Marxist Humanist Initiative, or MHI, aims to contribute to the transformation of this capitalist world by projecting, developing, and concretizing the philosophy of Karl Marx and its further development in the Marxist humanism articulated by Raya Donayevsky. 
Messiah. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and today's many other social, political, and economic crises make this a moment to engage people in discussion of these ideas. In the U.S., we are faced with the threat of Trumpism triumphing in all-out authoritarianism extinguishing our right to carry on these discussions. Yet at the same moment, the multiracial movement for black lives has spread to every corner of the country and the world, launching a flood of activism and new ideas that deepen the concept of freedom. MHI is dedicated to the task of proving theoretically that an alternative to capitalism is possible. We are distinguished by our economic analyses in which we do not merely assert but demonstrate that the only opposite to the current world economic system is its abolition and replacement with one not based on the production of, quote, value, close quote. Because capitalism cannot be fundamentally reformed, attempts to reform it lead to an intensification of state capitalism, not to socialism. We are not a political party, nor are we trying to lead the masses who will form their own organization and whose emancipation must be their own act. But we have seen that spontaneous actions alone are insufficient to usher in a new society. We seek a new unity of philosophy and organization in which mass movements striving for freedom lay hold of Marxist philosophy of revolution and recreate society on its basis. Our ideas and actions, as well as our structure and rules, are guided by the interests of working people and freedom movements of people of color, LGBTQ people, other minorities, women, youth, and all those around the world who are struggling for self-determination in order to freely develop their own human natures. We have no interests separate and apart from theirs. To this end, we open our website to the widest possible dialogue with people around the world. We intend to practice as well as espouse a two-way road between our organization and people outside it as essential to developing a single dialectic in the relationship of theory to practice and as the way to assure the survival of Marxist humanism. Please join us. I have noted that some people say, David, that your criticism of Chomsky uh, misses the mark because you don't understand what he means by computation or how he uses the term or what he does with computation. Uh, I wonder what your response to that is. First of all, this is the characteristic remark of all Chomskyans to any criticism of the Chomskyan paradigm that the critics don't understand it. And, you know, in most cases, when I'm criticizing Chomsky's use of computation, I'm quoting his actual words. This is the same thing we get from the Bitcoin critics. It is absolutely. It is the same thing. You know, it is a very practiced way of people with a certain kind of politics, how they react. And I, it's part, you know, I mean, the point of that book is that people who identify with computers a lot tend to have this, what I see as reactionary politics. And it, it's amazing how competitive it is. It happens all over the place when you get these reactionary like formations that are often in certain ways structured around technology and technological innovation. Chomsky is using computation as a metaphor. My interest in it is why he picks that metaphor. And I, it's very hard to see how one can sort of step away from that and say, well, he isn't using computation as a metaphor, or he means it literally, which would still be absolutely useful for my view. And one of my, I wrote a piece about a sort of more technical linguistics piece about minimalism. And I pointed out that in not just my opinion, but in the opinion of a lot of sort of anti-Chomskyan linguists, or just people who don't follow him, minimalism mimics the theories that the anti-Chomskyans have been pushing for decades. In fact, it One of the reasons I think Chomsky's work is actually kind of useful is it has really pushed people with alternative theories to sharpen their views and formalize them and make them more useful. And in my view, these these ideas have practically converged. And in fact, when you really press into it, trying to distinguish the theories is almost impossible. When you try to have this conversation with Chomskyans, their response is always, you don't understand the theory. And if you say, well, I think I do understand the theory, I think it's saying this, And that seems an awful lot like this other thing over here. And they might be right because they're so similar. And they'll say, no, you just fundamentally don't understand. And if you say, well, what don't I understand about it? They can't, they have, oh, this was my point was, I wrote this, I wrote this article about how these two theories have converged. And it is mostly comprised of 
quotations from Chomsky and to a lesser extent from Chomskyans articulating exactly what the theory is. And I sent it to a journal and they accidentally sent it out to some Chomskyans for review. And they accused me of misrepresenting and misunderstanding Chomsky's views by reference to the quotations that were literally Chomsky, as if they hadn't read the work or something. And, I, you know, your mind just boggles. They actually criticized, the thing that was funny about it was they criticized my use of um, abbreviations for the parts of the, the Chomsky theory and asked why I had to use so many of them. And they were literally Chomsky's abbreviations that I was taking from his own work. I'm like, this is how you present your theory. I'm trying to speak the language that you have. <laughs> okay, so so let me, let me try to see if I understand. They, they say you misunderstand. You say, and you cite chapter and verse. I'm, I'm quoting the great master himself. Here's what he said. So then it's only a question of interpretation. You say, this seems to me to be correct or adequate interpretation because of X, Y, and Z. So then the ball was in their court. And from what I'm hearing you say is there's silence on their part at that point. Absolutely. I mean, I, they say, well, Chomsky doesn't mean a literal computer. That's the best I've gotten out of them. You know, the brain isn't literally a computer. And I say, but I, I, I never said he said it's a literal computer exactly. I said, he says it's computation just as a computer does. Maybe he means that metaphorically, but what's important to me is that he that's the metaphor he chooses to use, and he's used it his whole career. And you've said that before, so you've responded, and the, the only adequate response from the other side would be to show that you are taking the term computation literally and saying that he actually thinks that the the brain or the mind or something engages in literal computation if they can't show that that's what you say then they should just be quiet because you've made your point and you're right you've understood it i i have an even more compact version of it which is you know i think he's gotten a little bit sloppy in some of his later work in some of his most recent stuff he says that when people challenge him about how all this stuff can be so separated inside the mind um, because he seems to be talking about functions that are available to a lot of different parts of cognition and language. And I've seen him say this in person, actually. He says, well, there's a little homunculus inside the brain that puts all this stuff together. And in a book called The Science of Language, when he tries to claim that his work has super scientific status, he actually, toward the end, says this, that there's a homunculus that puts all these functions together and can make them work together, even though they're they're separate and some deeper level. And I, in my, in an article about it, I said, look, he's invoking one of the, the cardinal anti-scientific images in the history of thinking about thinking. The idea that there's some kind of function in the brain that replicates all the functions that are found inside the brain, which just, you know, it's an infinite regress. He's saying, well, I can never answer this question. There's some other little guy in there who does all the same stuff that the brain does, but something extra too. And I'm very clear in the article, I don't think he means, and I don't care whether he means that there's a little guy in the brain who is doing this. He's saying there's a function in the brain that effectively duplicates all of the functions in the brain. And that is a ludicrous statement. And more than one critic, at least privately, came after me and said, well, you know, Noam doesn't think there's an actual little guy in there. And I'm like, first of all, he said it, not me. <laughs> and secondly, yes, he says it's a function. <laughs> like I, I, I'm being giving him credit by saying it's a function but it's a ludicrous statement even if it's a function he's saying i have no answer to the question of how the brain works at all well this is all totally fascinating i hope listeners have found it as interesting as i have because i really have never explored chomsky's linguistics before um i hope people read the article we're going to link to of yours david I, I i will again recommend the linguistics words which is an incredibly exciting reading and also gives you probably the best in, the best overview of what Chomsky's theories are that you will find anywhere. Well, David Columbia, thank you so much for being on the podcast once again today. This has been a great conversation. Hey, that's all the time we have for this episode of Radio Free Humanity. If you like the podcast, please do stop by MarxistHumanistInitiative.org to listen to other episodes and to read more about these issues and others. As always, if you like the podcast, we encourage you to write to us, to comment and rate the podcast, and of course to share with all your friends and enemies. 